We're in 1 John tonight. And tonight we're actually going to try to look at 1 John primarily, but then also 2 and 3 John very briefly tonight. And hopefully have some good discussion as well on our book. I think this is going to be tremendously helpful for all of us here. Of course, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John are written by the Apostle John. And of course, he wrote the book of Revelation as well and also the Gospel of John. So God blessed the Apostle John to write five books in the New Testament. And one thing that I love about the writing of John, now it's, it's obviously Scripture, the whole Bible Scripture, and yet each and every author of biblical books have their own personality. It comes out. It's like every preacher. Every preacher may preach the same message, but their personality comes out. It comes out in a different way, the way that God made them. John very often tells us why he wrote. In his Gospel in chapter 20, he says this, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So John's one of John's emphasis here in the Gospel of John is evangelism. I'm writing these things. Why? So you can be saved. So you can believe. So you can become Christians. Back in 1 John, he has, he has several purpose statements in John. In 1 John, look in verse 4 of chapter 1. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So one reason he wrote this book is so our joy can be f- full. It can be complete. So there's other purpose statements, but I think probably the most well-known and probably the one that captures really what this book is about primarily is in chapter 5, and that's going to be our emphasis tonight in just a few minutes, is chapter 5, verse 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So the Gospel of John was written so you could be saved. The book of 1 John was written so you can know that you're saved. So I love that about the Apostle John, how he just lays out why he's writing so plain to us there. So, and as you can imagine, this book, 1 John, is probably, if not one of, certainly it's the book to turn to when somebody is struggling with assurance of salvation. This is the reason that the book was written. And uh, one, one big thing that may help you, as it's helped me before, is that there's a big difference between assurance of salvation and salvation. Um, you can have money in the bank, and for some reason you don't think it's there. You know, some people are getting checks and things directly deposited. Maybe you're, from your job you get a check directly deposited. And, uh, and you may look at your watch and say, well, the money's not there yet. But really, if you look in your bank account, the money's already been deposited. So you can have money in the bank and not know it. The same way, you can be saved and yet not have full assurance of it. Uh, many Christians go through doubts sometimes of their salvation. So there's a big distinction between salvation and assurance of salvation. You can be saved and have doubts. On the flip side, you can think you are saved without any doubt and actually not be saved. So we see those distinctions made, and one of the ways we see that is in this letter here. Excuse me. Let me just name a few of the themes of the gospel or the epistle of John. Holy living is a big theme of 1 John. Our relationship with sin is a big theme. Love, the sinful world, false teaching, God's Spirit, believing the right things, the person of Jesus Christ, and then assurance of salvation. These are all themes and teachings that are found in this five chapters that is found in 1 John. And some of these things we'll be looking at tonight. Let me give you just a little bit of the background of this book. It'll be very beneficial to all of us. The background appears to be this. There has been some people who have left the church. And they haven't left the church in, in this day and time. You didn't have Christian Church 1, Christian Church 2, Christian Church 3 in each city. You had one church. 
So when people left the church, that means they left Jesus Christ. And we're going to be reading chapter 2 in just a minute, and we'll start in verse 19. So what we have here is there's, there's been some people leave the church, and it appears to have had a bad effect on some of the church members. I mean, you can imagine, let's say we have somebody in our congregation who's maybe been listening to some false teaching, and after a few months or even a few years, they leave the church and they say, I don't believe like you all anymore. It's not that they believe in baptism a little bit differently than we do, or they believe in this a little bit differently than we do. It's that they actually don't believe at all like we do anymore. They think what we believe is heresy. They believe Jesus Christ was not God, etc. I mean, that could shake some of us up, especially if they were somebody who's been in the church for years. Now, just imagine if it's a leader or even a pastor of a church. He comes out all of a sudden and says, you know what, I don't believe the Bible is God's Word anymore. And I want to be honest with you. I want to be honest with myself. And I'm leaving Christianity. We've seen some of that, haven't we, over the last few years? We've seen some. One in particular, I'm thinking of a former preacher, minister, I believe, now is a homosexual, who was once an evangelical. So we see these things happening, and just think about that person. Maybe you looked up to that person for years, and you believe that person knew more about the Bible than you did, and now that same person is saying, I don't even believe the Bible anymore. That'd be pretty shaking, wouldn't it, to faith? Well, look at this starting in verse 19, 1 John chapter 2. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. So the people who went out, John says here in this case, they were never part of us really. But look what he says next, and this is really important to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. So this book is meant to encourage us in the faith, and I hope that's what it does to, tonight. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go through 1 John and we're going to look at, we're going to focus on the passages about assurance of salvation. And certainly these passages can, can shake up a false Christian, show them the error of their way, and then lead them to repentance and faith. But the primary purpose actually of this book is to help Christians be assured of what they believe in and to be assured that they truly are born again. So I hope that it helps all of us tonight in the ways that God has for us. So let's start here in chapter 1. <clears throat> and as always, any questions and comments are always welcomed and discussion. I hope to have some good discussion tonight. <clears throat> Basically, what we're going to be looking at are tests for us. And uh, John would want all of us to be able to, I don't mean this in a trite way, but check off the box of each of these tests and say, you know what, I'm more confident now of my salvation, I'm more confident of Christianity, I'm more confident of what God has done for me now than I was when I first walked in tonight. So may the Lord help us. Chapter 1, verse 5. In many ways, like it's been said, this is the key verse of this epistle. It says, this is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So John begins by telling us who God is. John says that God is light. In God there is no darkness at all. He's all light. He's all righteousness. He's all holy. Now, if that is true about God, what does that mean for God's people then? If God is a God of light, yes. Right. That means we're children of light. So this really sets up the whole book for us. When you read 1 John, you can really remember that verse as well as, as chapter 5, verse 13. 
If God is light and there is no darkness in Him, that means His followers will have light and not darkness. And as we'll see, that does not mean that once we become Christians, we never sin again to the day that we die. That's not what this book means. But it does mean there has been a radical change happen to us once we become Christians. Well, look in verse 6 and 7. Here's a test of life. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if you see a Christian who says that I am a child of light, they live their life though in darkness, John has some strong words. He says we lie and do not practice the truth. But look in verse 7. Here's the very encouraging part for, for those who do walk in the light. It says, but if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. So, whenever you became a Christian, God forgave you of all of your sins. But here's the good news. God didn't stop there. As we walk with God, the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us. It's cleansing us even now. It takes our sin away even now. It's not like we got saved however many years ago, and now we just have to make sure our slate is clean. You ever hear anybody talk about keeping your slate clean? I believe in that. We need to keep our slate clean. But it's not as if we have, God forgives us, He gives us this clean piece of paper. Every time we sin, though, we have to put a mark on that paper. And we're not saved until we get rid of that mark. The Bible says here the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. It continues to cleanse us. Of course, when we sin, we want to confess that sin, don't we? And that's exactly what we go up to now in verse 8, 9, and 10. One of the signs that someone's become a Christian is that their attitude towards sin has radically changed. That's one of the signs of a true born-again Christian. But look what it starts with, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now that certainly applies to maybe you've run into some people who are very proud and they think they've never sinned and they've never done anything at all deserving of forgiveness before. Well, the Bible says here that person is deceived. And if you look in verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So all of us have sinned. But it's very insightful, I think, that John doesn't say if an outsider says this. Look what he says in verse 8 again, if we say. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned. So we have to be very careful, even as Christians, um, unless we come to the point where we think we're just above other Christians and we are, we're something else. That's not the attitude of humility, is it? Let me just read one verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It's helpful on this. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. Solomon says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. So Solomon says there's not a man on earth who always does what's right and never sins. There's not a man on earth like that, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So we see what's our attitude towards sin. First of all, our sin is acknowledged, isn't it? We're humble before God. We acknowledge our sin. We don't try to say, I've never sinned. We don't try to say that I'm sinless now. Now, I remember John Wesley. I can't remember the quote exactly. He may have said 60 years. But uh, he may have said something like this, that he had not sinned on purpose in 60 years. And that's something all of us should strive for. But all of us... You may be here tonight and you say, I've not on purpose sinned in X amount of time. That's wonderful. We ought not to. But all of us have a bad attitude sometimes, don't we? Uh, someone we love very much does something. That's not that bad. We can overreact sometimes. 
especially like me, if the kids, I can overreact and things like that. So all of us have sin still in that sense, though we, we fight against it. We don't want it. So part of our relationship with sin is we're humble about it. We acknowledge it. And now finally, verse 9, that great verse that's been a blessing to no doubt how many Christians before. If we confess our sins, so you see our attitude towards sin has changed so much. Not only are we humble about it and we acknowledge it, now we confess it. Confess it to God. The word confess there means to agree with. So basically, to confess means we come to God, we agree with God that our sin is wrong, and we ask Him to forgive us. That's what He wants us to do. That's what Christians do. Um, one man talked about how hiding our sin from God is like hiding our cancer from the only doctor who can cure it. So one of the signs that people are truly saved is, they, is that they acknowledge their sin. They give it to God. They, they confess it. And here's the great promise. If we confess our sins... Now notice there's no uh, footnote in your Bibles listing the amount of sin or the type of sins you can confess and not confess. It's not there. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no sin whatsoever that God will not forgive if it is truly confessed. I'm sorry? I thought you said that. Well, if we have done something like all of us have done, and maybe later we realize it, years later, well, we confess it then, but there's nothing we can do about it. Um, at the time, if we don't know we did it, is that what you mean, Brother Arnold? Right. Yeah. There's a lot of wisdom. It depends on what they're doing. Depends on how well you know them. Depends on how often you see it. But if God give, gives us opportunities, we need to try to help them at some point. Uh, realizing, of course, that... Remember when Jesus talks about um, someone wanting to, to get the speck out of your eye while they got the... What, what what's it say? The moat the big piece of wood in your eye. That's not exactly what he's teaching on one level, but uh, when we're dealing with people, we want to try to help them see the big things before maybe the medium things, because the big things should be easier to see. So we, there's wisdom involved, but we do have to try to point sin out, don't we, in a, in a humble way. And it's... It can, can cause problems, certainly. Um, but, it, that's, yes, you're exactly right. That's a good point. If, if we're going to try to help somebody, ideally, if we're trying to help somebody, they're not going to point the finger right at us like that. They're going to deal with themselves. But that person, if he points out something in our lives that's true, we should be able to try to humbly accept it like we wanted them to, too. So that's exactly right, yeah. Mm. Right. Right. Well, that's good. That's that's a great sign of a Christian right there who can take that and try to improve by that. That's a wonderful sign of a Christian man or woman. And you know what we should try to do here at Double Branch is just have an atmosphere where we can lovingly be honest with people about differences and faults we see here, faults we see there. We should have an atmosphere here where we can lovingly do that, and try to learn from that. 
I need to learn from things. You need to learn from things. So we need to try to have that kind of atmosphere here at the church. We want to be open with people about things like that. That's good. Anybody else? So we see here, a true Christian, their attitude towards sin has changed. They're humble about it. They ask God to forgive them for it. Look here in chapter 2 now. I wasn't going to look at these verses, but I'm going to. Verse 1 and 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. You see another reason he's writing. He doesn't want us to sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So what he says there is, if anyone sins, we have an advocate. We have one that's called alongside to help us. He speaks on behalf of us. His name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. The word righteous there really is helpful because it shows his character. Why can he speak on our behalf to the Father? He can speak on our behalf because He is the righteous one. and He died for us. Verse 2, And He Himself is the propitiation. You know, there's some words in the Bible that we can can bring down and translate differently, especially for different age groups. But this is a good word for all of us to learn. This is a very important word. Propitiation is talking about His uh, sacrifice that takes away wrath. Jesus took away the wrath of God from us. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. That's one of the verses there why we believe Jesus died for everyone. But what we see here is this. When we do sin, God doesn't kick us out of the family, does He? When Christians sin, God doesn't kick us out. When Christians sin, we have an advocate in heaven, Jesus Christ, and He speaks on our behalf to the Father. I don't know what He says, but no doubt He he speaks about Him dying for that sinner. He's already died for that sinner. He makes intercession for us. So we see the the security that we have as Christians. Now, let's go to verse 3 and 4. Here's another test of life for us that the Bible has. By this we know that we have come to know Him. How? If we keep His commandments. You ever run into somebody who thought the commandments of God was legalism? I don't want to do all that legalism. You're preaching law to me. I'm, going, I'm, I'm not under law. I'm under grace. Forget about His commandments. Well, one of the ways you know you're saved is if you keep His commandments. The Bible says. And look in verse 4. Now, the Apostle John is known as the Apostle of Love. And... Uh, do you remember what he and his brother, Jesus, called them in the Gospel once? Do you remember what he called them? Sons of... Jesus called them sons of thunder at one place. So we see, maybe just to understand, because John speaks so much of love, we see how God changed John. He was a son of thunder once. Now he's known as the apostle of love, is how people have viewed him. But he's still got thunder. Verse 4, the one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So there's, there's people all over the world tonight who say that I love God and they say that I'm a Christian and what John would say to that person is you're a liar because you do not keep the commandments of God. Now, Well, first, remember verse 5 of chapter 1, God is light, in Him is no darkness at all. If we are truly God's people, we're people of light, not people of darkness. God has transformed us. He saved us. Now, let me give you an illustration I heard once from a preacher about this verse. And he compared it to a camera that you would take pictures with and something you would record video with. And he compared it this way, and it was really helpful to me. He said that this verse, and the verses like it in this book as well, but this verse is not looking at someone following you around for 24 hours and taking pictures of you. You know, if 
if somebody followed you around for 24 hours or maybe a month, <laughs> however long it was, and uh, no doubt they would hear you on the phone maybe, get upset at somebody, and they'd take a picture of you. Or they would, uh, they would see you doing something you shouldn't do, and they'd take a picture of you. And at the end of the day, they'd come to you and say, look at this, you hypocrite. I got, I got evidence here, evidence here. Look at you sinning. The Bible says, the one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Look at these pictures. You are a liar. The truth is not in you. The point is, that's not how this verse is looking at. This verse, in the, in the book of 1 John, the Bible as a whole, is if somebody followed you around for an amount of time with a, a, a video camera or a phone and they're, they're recording you, that's what this is looking at. The video recording, of course, will see the times you do things you ought not do, but it will also show the times you repent of those sins. And it also will show the good things that you do. It will also show your faithfulness. So the point is this. It's not if we ever sin, we're not a Christian. No, the point is our lifestyle has been changed. Our habit of life has been dramatically transformed. That's it. That's the sign of a Christian. Yes, we keep the commandments of God, Solomon has already said in, in Ecclesiastes, no, there's not a righteous man on earth who never sins. We know that. So what this is looking at is our life has changed. We, we're not what we want to be, but we are what we are by the grace of God, and God has changed our life. And if we can look back through the years, we can say, you know what? I'm not where I want to be yet, but I am sure different than I used to be. That's, that's what it's looking at here. God has made this huge, huge transformation in our life. So that's the way we ought to view these things in the Bible. Now, comments or questions about that? Any, anybody have any thoughts about that? That's a very bad thing, yes. So when we do wrong and we feel convicted over it, that's actually a really good thing. Of course, we need to repent after that, but that's a sign that we are saved. That could be a sign we actually know God. Um, I discipline my children. Courtney disciplines her children. We normally don't discipline other people's children because they're not ours. So when we do wrong, God disciplines His children because we belong to Him. So... God's discipline is actually a sign that we do know Him. We do know Him. Anybody else? Hmm. Right, right, right. He that knows to do good and doesn't do it to him, it's sin. Yes. So that's certainly something all of us need to be careful about. And, and not only to avoid the bad things, but make sure we're doing the good things as well. That's, that's a very good point. Yes. That we're going to sin? Right, right, sure. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. He loves us, cares for us. And, that's, and something else to point out that has been pointed out before, look at how these verses go back to back to back. Um, 
Let's see. For instance, verse 8, we have no sin. We're, we're not speaking the truth. I'm just paraphrasing here. Verse 9, let's confess our sins. He'll forgive us, okay? Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we're a liar, okay? Chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 talks about God's grace and mercy upon us. And someone may get the idea, well, you know what, God, if I sin, i got an advocate in heaven. Yeah, you know what, maybe I'll sin here and He'll forgive me for it. I know He will. Well, it comes right back to verse 3 and 4. It talks about if, if we know Him, we'll keep His commandments. So what we see here is safety guards here. Yes, we see God's grace. We also see warnings, though. So they help us stay on the right path. Let us not take advantage of God's grace, but let us not despair if we do something wrong, because if we come back to Him, God will forgive us. Right, that's, and I think that's something this book's going to talk more about in the fact that if somebody just will, willfully goes out and sins all the time, they're showing themselves not to be a Christian. Um, if someone does willfully sin, as soon as they repent, God will forgive them, but they have to repent. And repentance is not always an easy thing. Uh, we just can't repent, you know. I think so. I think so. Probably so. I think so. And uh, repentance, you know, the devil, before someone's saved, the devil says, you know what? Repentance is easy. All you got to do is ask God to forgive you. Why don't you go sin some more? But when that person gets serious about God, the devil comes by and says, you know what? You had all that opportunity. I think God, he doesn't really want to save you anymore. So you might as well not even try. So the devil attacks you from both ways. He says that repentance is easy at one minute, and then he says repentance is impossible the next minute. What all of us need to do is just repent as soon as we can. Uh, repent. Anybody else? Look in verse 6. We'll look about halfway through verse 5 first. By this we know that we are in Him. How do we know that? Verse 6. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So how do we know that we are Christians? We walk just like Jesus Christ walked. How many of you have ever had a child or a grandchild? Maybe you're out making tracks in the dirt or the mud. Uh, probably not the snow too much down here. But, uh, but have, a, have a child or a grandchild try to walk in your steps. You ever seen somebody do that before? I've seen that before. And obviously, your steps are too big for them, but they are trying all with all their might to walk right behind you. Well, that's, that's what this is looking at here. Uh, none of us can walk perfectly like Jesus Christ walked in this earth. He's the God-man. That doesn't give us an excuse to sin, but, but we still have a sinful flesh. Uh, all of us want to be like Jesus, and we need to strive to be like Him, and we can become more like Him. But all of our efforts are going to be not exactly like Jesus' effort. But here's the thing, just like we talked about a few minutes ago, are we truly trying to walk in His steps? And uh, we're, going to, we're going to slip sometimes, Sometimes we might look a little silly even. But are we truly walking in His steps? And if we are, that's what that verse is looking at. We're truly walking like Christ. We're loving people. We're caring for people. We're forgiving. Uh, we have a tender heart. We truly want to be like Jesus. That's what, that's what this book is looking at. It's not looking at sinless perfection. It's not looking at things like that. It's looking at a heart that's been transformed 
And we are really and truly trying to walk with our Savior and love Him and get better and better and better as Christians. And if that's us, that's a sign that we've been born again. That's a, that's, that's a sign that God has saved us. And it may be like for, for some people, and I'm in this situation, I made a confession of faith when I was young, and man, it, it was real. I was 11 years old, and I was convicted. And I asked the preacher, he was in a Sunday school room, it was a vacation Bible school, and I, I said, are we going to have an altar call tonight? He said, yeah, I think we can. I was under conviction. And I came forward, and this is what I know. I know my life after that did not change. I lived just the same way as everybody else, to some degree at least, in middle school and in high school. My life didn't change. So I wasn't trying to walk like Jesus at that time. But thankfully, when I got about 19 or 20, God began to work in my heart, and I was changed by God's grace. So if we can say in our life we are truly trying to walk like Jesus, we're trying to be like Him, that's what this verse is looking at here tonight. Look in verse 9, 10, and 11, and we are not going to finish tonight, which that's a good thing though. It means we're, I think the Lord's blessing us and we're having good discussion as well. So, Verse 9, 10, 11 of chapter 2. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So love is such a big thing. Love for brothers and sisters in the faith. It's a huge thing, a huge thing about whether we know that we're saved or not. And uh, one of the signs that we love our brothers and sisters is we love fellowship. We love to talk about the things of the Lord with each other. Uh, we love to talk about the Bible. We love to talk about what ministries we're trying to work at. Uh, we love to talk about how good the Lord is. These are all signs that we love the brothers and sisters here. We, we want to be with them because we love them and that they're our family. It's one of the things I've missed so much about our fellowships on Sunday night. I'm glad this month we're going to have another one at some time. But I just miss sitting down and talking with each other and fellowship. Look down here, and this could possibly be the last place we look at tonight. Verse 16, 15, 16, and 17. So what you see in 1 John is he's going to touch on so many different things, so many different things about signs of true Christianity. And now he talks about holy living, and in specific, our relationship with the world. Do not love the world. Now the Bible says that God loves the world, right? In John 3.16, so how do you think the word world is being used here? And how do you think the word world is being used in John 3.16? John 3.16 says God loves the world. 1 John 2.15 says that we are not to love the world. Obviously, the world is being used differently. How do you think it's being used differently? Yes, worldliness, right? Anybody else? Right. It's different, isn't it? It's different is what it's looking at. So here, the word world is defined for us down in verse 16. Uh, Let's just start in verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now verse 16 tells us what the world is. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. So those three things is what John's looking at here. The lust of the flesh, these evil desires we have, and maybe specifically there, as well, sexual sins. 
and the lust of the eyes, the things that we see, may we want. And then, and the boastful pride of life, boasting, pride, arrogance, it says, is not from the Father, but is from the world. That's the world that it's looking at here. When it says that God so loved the world in John 3.16, that's speaking of sinful people. God loves sinful people. He wants to save them. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world, didn't he? He wants everyone to be saved. He loves them. Here it's talking about the sinful things of this world, uh, not the people. That, that could be part of what he's looking at here. Desires that are wrong and desiring other things other than God. That, that could be one thing there. Look in verse 17 at the warning. The world is passing away. In effect, John is saying to people, why are you chasing after all these things that are passing away? Why are you chasing after sin that only lasts for a season and then it's gone? Why are you wasting your life? The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. John says, look, don't love these sinful, wicked things of the world. Don't love the sinful sexuality of this world. Don't love the pride of life. Don't love and, and lust after it. The newest thing that everybody else has and you only want it so you can look good in the world. Don't lust after all these things. John says, do what the Father wants you to do, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. This, of course, is not saying it's, it's, not saying it's wrong to have nice things. It's not saying it's, it's wrong to enjoy things sometimes. It's not saying those things. But it's specifically looking at the rejection of God, of course, but primarily the loving of sinful things. The loving, and, the, and that's what it's looking at. The priority of sinful things. That's what I want. I want the sinful world and this world system over against God. Any comments or questions there? Well, we may stop there because we may just have let's see just look down the last verse in chapter 2 and we're going to see more of this Lord willing uh, next week I hope Last verse of chapter 2, If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. That goes back to chapter 1, verse 5. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Well, if He is light and there's no darkness at all, His children are going to represent that in their life. Again, all of us are growing. We're all still on the Christian journey. None of us have made it home yet. But God has changed us. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. So John is a, 1 John is a book that has grace in it, but it is certainly a book that has holiness and righteousness in it. And God willing, next week we'll continue and we'll pick up somewhere in chapter 3 next week.